Hello everybody, today's presentation is going to be about the uh, 17th century English poetry and uh, its future qualifications and uh, as well as the uh, specifications school of poetry, the poets of the 17th century as well as the most obvious and most uh, important characteristics of the poetry of the 17th century. So, the 17th century in English history <coughs> was a rather troubled one. Religious differences and controversies, political disputes, and strife stuffed the tortured years of the century. The religious issues, in fact, were interwoven with these of politics. No wonder, then, that the pulpit in this age had a political as well as religious significance so this introduction is going to can uh, is going to include two uh, uh, two sections the first section is the religious differences as well as the political disputes the religious differences religion in 17th century assumed an important and paralleled in the previous ages According to Major Cooks, nearly half of the books published between 1600 and 1640 were on religious topics. The Church of England, the Church of uh, England, grew in power and uh, seems to encompasses the whole nation as the century proceeded. This was cause enough to widen the gap between it and Rome, the seat of Rome in Catholicism. At home, the rapid growth of Puritanism also seems to cleave the nation into two conflicting parties, though both of them belong to the same church. The second part is the political disputes in 17th century. The political troubles of this age were aggravated by the unwise policies of the two monarchs, James I and his son Charles I. They assumed that they were rulers by divine right, and so their policies made them quite unpopular with their people and parliament. The people and parliament had to curb the growing political and religious tyranny of monarchs definitely Charles I, and thus the civil war broke out in 1642 between Charles I and his followers, the royalists, on the one hand, and the parliament and its supporters, the round heads, on the other hand. King Charles I was defeated and later executed in 1649. For the following 11 years, an Ulster Puritan Oliver Cromwell, chief leader of the parliamentary forces, establishes a kind of Republican, Republican uh, Commonwealth which the English people did not find attractive or adequate. Uh, during the period of the Commonwealth poetry was despised, theatres were kept closed and all kinds of amusements were abolished. The Commonwealth did not last after Cromwell's death, and the British soon welcomed the return of the heir to the throne, Charles II in 1660. The restoration of the monarchy to England did not lessen the achievements of parliamentary fights for curbing the tyranny of the king. The monarchy became constitutional, and the supremacy of the House Commons was established soon after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Thus, the religious turbulence and political instability of the age affected the literature of the period in general and poetry in particular. The effect showed itself in the rich variety of poetic genre and poetic styles, as it showed itself in the lack of a typical 17th century outlook.
the second important part of this presentation is going to display or displays the uh, different types of poetry and different types of groups of poets who have been uh, followed each other's and specifically we are talking today about the metaphysical school of poetry or a kind of a school which is called the uh, or that follows the uh, specific kinds of philosophy that have been established or first found by uh, John Donne, it is the metaphysical poetry. The second group of poets follows Ben Jonson, and this a group of poets is sometimes called the Sons of Pens or the Tribe of Pen, which follows definitely the uh, Ben Jonson's poetry. The third group, which is the um, or represented by John Milton and his poetry who stands alone as a complete school of poetry and the last of this is the poetry of John Dryden that flourished in the period after the uh, 1660 which is called the age of restoration the first of these kinds of uh, groups is the metaphysical poetry what is the meaning of metaphysical and who was the first one to use this kind of uh, item or a term which is metaphysical so in the full sense of the term it is a poetry which has been inspired by a philosophical conception of the universe and the rule assigned to human spirit in the great drama of existence Metaphysical is a term used to group together certain 17th century poets. Usually the first among them or the founder of this group is John Donne, Andrew Marvel, Henry Vaughan, and other figures like Abraham Cooley are sometimes included in this list or in the list. The poets share or the poets share common characteristics of which uh, inventiveness and a love of elaborate stylistic monavu. Again, metaphysical poetry or the metaphysical concerns are the common subject of their poetry, which investigate the world by rational discussion of its phenomena rather than by intuition or mysticism. Dryden, in fact, was the first poet to apply the term to 17th century poetry when in 1693 he criticized Dunn's poetry and he says he affects he Dryden uh, sorry uh, John Dunn he affects the metaphysics in his amorous verses where nature only should reign and burblexes the minds of the fear sex with nice speculation of philosophy when he should engage their hearts again metaphysical poets adopted a style that is energetic uneven and rigorous so much praise have been given to the group or to this group of the 17th century by so many critics among them the uh, the um, the most important critics of the 20th century T.S. Eliot in one of his essays in 1921 T.S. Eliot argued or discussed that the work of the metaphysical poets fuses reasons with passion it shows a unification of thoughts and feeling which later became separated into a dissociation of sensibility Uh, the uh, this page is uh, or this page is uh, highly concerned with who are the metaphysical poets the first poets the founder of this group or the leader of this group who has been followed by the others he is John Donne the second is George Herbert Raj, Richard de Crashwell Henry Vaughan Thomas <coughs> Carroll, Abraham Cowley, and 
Andrew Marvel. As they have constituted just like or school-like group and the poetry of the 17th century, so this group should has its own characteristics, or their poetry should include a feature that gather all of them all together in one a group, which is called the characteristics of metaphysical poetry. The first among these uh, features is intellectuality or showing learning or show the faculty of learning of those poets. The second feature is a fusion of passion and thoughts, which means that the poets of this group they succeeded in combining minds and hearts all together in or within one poem or within one thought. It is not far away from these two important features is the uh, significant one which is the use of the conceit. And not far away from conceit, the metaphysical wit which is so much significance to the study of metaphysical poetry. Number five, another feature which is the carelessness of or induction. It means that their poetry is less concerned with the poetic diction and the most outstanding which is so much preferable by other poets the use of colloquial speech so colloquialism is already existed strongly in the poets of the metaphysical poetry uh, sometimes the metaphysical poetry is called a religious poetry and this is seen uh, clearly in the poetry of John Donne and his followers. Um, John Donne succeeded in showing a kind of a spiritual love. So, one of the uh, outstanding features of uh, metaphysical poetry is love. The first of these features, one may ask, what is the meaning of intellectuality? is the show or the uh, express of the faculty or the apology of learning among those poets. So intellectuality, the metaphysical poets were men of learning. Their poetry reveals their scholarship. To show learning is their chief object. They twisted their vast learning in their poetry. Uh, due to this, metaphysical poetry became very difficult to understand. Again, intellectuality, one of the things that have been used by the poets to show um, the most uh, important, most unique features of the age as a whole, it's not just the poetry. The age of 17th century was age of uh, geographical discoveries and the growth or a rapid growth in different kinds of science. So intellectuality was one of the uh, uh, means used by the poets to show their ability or understanding of the new world. Let's consider Dunn's method and the good moral there is the opening question and then the development of the original thought in terms of ideas derived from philosophy or scientific notion. So he said, I wonder by my truth what thou and I did till we loved. The following feature is the combination of thoughts of the minds and the passion of the hearts. There is an intellectual analysis of emotion in Dunn's poetry. Though every lyric arises out of some emotional situation, the emotion 
is not merely expressed, rather it is analyzed. Dunn's poem, A Valediction for Bidding Morning, proves that lovers need not mourning at parting. And, for instance, he said, So let us melt and make no noise, no tear flutes, nor sight tempest move, twere profanation of our joys, to tell the laity our love. So the poets mixed different kinds of passion with a logical thinking. To prevent tears from or to prevent crying or weeping is a kind of a secret. Tearing or weeping is declaring for the other the secret. So he encouraged both of the two lovers not to cry in order to keep the secret or keep their love secret far away from others. So emotions, feelings, passions have been mixed with a logical thinking, a logical ideas of the minds. Conceit. One may ask or the most important question is what is conceit? A significant feature of metaphysical poetry is the use of metaphysical conceit. It is a unique quality of metaphysical poetry. Conceit is a far-fetched comparison of two dissimilar things which have very little in common by this comparison. The meaning then is to hold a comparison between two things that are rarely similar to each other, rarely related to each other. It is a kind of imagery or an extended imagery from uh, the Elizabethan age, but with different ways. Let's consider the following example. Ibrahim Kolo, uh, Ibrahim Kohli, sorry, in his poem, The Mistress, compares his love for ladies to his habits of traveling in various countries of the world, and said, Hast thou not found each woman's breast, the lands where thou hast traveled, either by savages possessed, or wild and inhabited? What joy! could stake or what reposes in countries so uncivilized as those. Some of the students may are going to be confused with the word wit or the use of wit and intellectuality, the first feature of metaphysical poetry. But in reality, in reality, sorry, they are different from each other. There is a great variety. There is a great kind of disconnection between an, between a wit, sorry, and intellectuality. So let's discover what is the meaning of using wit in metaphysical poetry. There are various illusions and images relating to practicality in all areas of nature and art and learning, to medicine, cosmology, contemporary discoveries, ancient myth, history, law and art. So all of the areas of science, whether humanist or none, they are going to be covered by the thoughts, uh, by the ideas, by the use of those poets. For instance, in the Ecstasia, Duns uses the belief of the blood containing certain spirits which acts as intermediate between uh, soul and body. And this one of the uh, scientific uh, as well as uh, spiritual notions which was known in the beginning or in the middle of the 17th century. So he applied the idea in his own poetry and said, as our blood labors to get spirits as like souls as it can, because such fingers need to knit that subtle note which makes us man. 
so he shows his learning he shows his belief in this kinds of theories or and definitely in the theory of uh, blood carrying or con uh, containing uh, spirits that helps the body to get its uh, nutrition so the uh, poet shows the way of learning and show himself as a scholar who has a great part or who knows more about even the uh, the physical uh, thoughts the physical uh, truth about the body of human beings which related to either medicine or something else the same fields of what now we are going to consider another example it is by or from the poem to his coimistress the poet said the graves is a fine and brave place but not i think do uh, but no one i think do the impress metaphysical poetry is different from elizabethan poetry in the poetic diction or the use of the poetic diction metaphysical poems reacted against overcrowded sweetness and harmony of Elizabethan poetry it means that uh, metaphysical poetry came as a reaction against the uh, the harmony as well as the poetic diction used by the poets of the 16th century they deliberately avoided conventional poetic expressions they employed very brutal words thus in their poetic works rugged and unpoetic words their versification and their dictions are usually coarse and jerky poems are free from the least notion of poetic diction now uh, the best or the most outstanding uh, kinds of example is george herbert's the cola in his poem the cola herbert used a kinds of a normal speech or a kinds of a normal words if phrases and uh, sentences that could be used by normal people with no uh, or he didn't pay a uh, great attention for the poetic diction or a high style of using uh, different words so he start his poem by I struck the board and decried no more I will approach what shall ever sigh and pine so words are symbol and the poem is start with exclamation or a question in form of exclamation then followed by what this way of poetry or this kinds of clearness in diction it's always play an important part in the uh, in the poetic style because it um, uh, from the beginning of the poem it focuses the attention or it captures the attention of the re of the hearer or the reader of that poetry uh, not far away from the other uh, qualifications or uh, features of the metaphysical poetry colloquialism or the use of colloquial speech this is especially apparent in the abrupt means surprised a dramatic and conversational opening of many of Dunn's poems for instance one of his poems start by or start with sorry for God's sake hold your tongue and let me love so he's using a very um, specific words or a normal words a colloquial words could be used by different people or a normal people in his own age not far away from the others religion and religious facts of the poetry of the metaphysical uh, group so some critics 
um, refers to metaphysical poetry as religious and amorous. Metaphysical poetry may be classified into two broad divisions of amorous and religious verses. The former was written by Cairo and Sackling and the later by Herbert Crashua and Vaughan. Um, the the last or the uh, the important characteristics of poetry always poetry associated with emotions feelings and so on as the metaphysical poetry dealings with science learning and the um, the cleverness of the poets it is not or it doesn't mean that's void of love but the love that is used by the this group of the metaphysical is different from other loves a difference or it is different from the physical love that we know normally so the poets of the metaphysical they use a platonic love so what is platonic love platonic love is another feature of metaphysical poetry platonic love means spiritual love which is free from elements of physical love and this is clear or appears in John's dance is famous for treating spiritual love in his poems for example in the canonization he considers love as a sanctified thing having a look at the following examples which provide an evidence of a platonic love in his poetry and John, uh, uh, John Dunn said but he who loveless within hath found all outward loathes for he who colors who color loves and skin loves but their oldest clothes we are moving to another poet who could be considered as a great poet of 6th 17th century he is Ben Johnson and Ben Johnson is not alone as he uh, could be considered one of the greatest and he has a great influences or exerted a great influence on the other poets who follows his style or the poetry of Ben Jonson so Ben Jonson was a masterful poet as well as a dramatist his poetry has the reputation of being remote from modern readers Ben Jonson could be considered a dedicated classist or he prefers a classism always a classist poetry or classical poetry Johnson emphasized clarity of form and the phrases over expression of emotion he studied the poetic forms of a classical Greek and Latin literature as well as those of later European literature and he used what he learned in his own works again his poetry is very diverse including salutations and love poems homilies and satires epigrams and lyrics and so on so it's really diverse much of his poetry or much of the po uh, much of the poetry of Ben Johnson appeals primarily to academics because of its experimental qualities and it's it displays of uh, or it displays of technical uh, virtuosity as we said in the beginning of uh, alluding or making reference to Ben Johnson Ben Johnson uh, exerted a great influence on different writers and poets of his own age so those poets 
later have been classified as the sons of Ben or the tribe of Ben means Ben Johnson those followers or those imitator of Ben Johnson uh, the first of them he is Robert Herrick Edmund Waller John Sackling and Richard Lovelace and this page um, a short um, summed up uh, a kind of summary for the uh, or a short features of Ben Johnson's poetry so his poetry again against Elizabethan or as a reaction against the Elizabethan traditions of poetry the poetry of Ben Johnson a poetry of a new tone clarity and decalum it has love of a classical form so these are the main characteristics of the poetry of Ben Johnson and again as we are talking about Ben Johnson and his followers the first among them he is Robert Herrick the most devout of the sons of Ben turn like his master Johnson or he's addicted he turned to the classical lyrics of or for an inspiration but he combined classical elements with English folk themes consider for the or for the following example this play on the crab crab dame theme in his poem to the version to make much of time where he said then be not coy but use your time and while ye may go marry for having lost but once your prime you may forever tarry this is one of the best examples of his poetry how he mixed the uh, the elements of a classical poetry as well as the folk themes of his own country and his own time the or among the followers of Ben Johnson a group of poet which is called the courtiers or the cavaliers the courtiers or the cavalier includes main poets they are just like Richard Lovelace uh, John Sickling and Edmund Waller see they have learned much from Johnson's verse but they are also described as imitator who standardized and simplified the mode they draw from Ben Johnson Richard Lovelace was a true cavalier poet he fought with Charles the first the circumstances of his cavalier's life provide him with a perfect poetic opportunity this is notable from the poems like to La Casta going to La Casta going to the war and his to Alfie from Brazen Lovelace uses Petrarchian imagery but it is also an imagery affected by the metaphysical the second poet John Sackling Sackling of all the cavalier group had the largest potentialities of poetry but his best verses are the high or the lightest and the example of the following out o, uh, out a bonnet I have loved three whole days together and I'm like to love three more if it prove fair weather this is one of the best examples of the poetry of John Sackling for love Edmund Waller or Waller's case is different one may note in his poetry Johnsonian neatness Cavalier ease and grace and streaks of metaphysical passionate thoughts Waller will now in poem go lovely rose is in the past tradition of cavalier song 
while his poem of the last verses in the book written in the heroic couplet illustrate the moves towards epigram so this is in short the uh, best group of the followers of Ben Johnson or a short description for the achievements of those cavaliers as well as the courtiers the important poets of the 17th century or one of the greatest poets of the 17th century he is John Milton John Milton the greater part of John Milton's lyric poetry was written during his residence at Cambridge between 1625-1632 and at Horton Hammersmith uh, uh, 1632-1638. The early lyrics may owe something to Milton's prologians, which are academic exercises on a set theme with a predictable lines of arguments ornamented with numerous classical illusions. The poems of John Milton cover a wide variety of topics for example the death of Bishop or the death of an infant or the death of the university career the anniversary of the gunpowder blood and religious topics as well over the period of approximately 30 years milton or john milton wrote 23 uh, sonnets among them some of the most memorable lyrics in english as with other genres he made contributions to the form means to the uh, writings or a great contribution to the writings of sonnet and this instance both in thematic and stylistic direction the most memorable poetry or the chief poetical works of John Milton are the first one Camas Lacidas, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regain, and Samson Agonistes. John Milton always is memorized for his Paradise Lost. Always, if we are talking about John Milton, so we are talking about the story of the Paradise Lost. It is an epic or a great heroic epic poem. Milton had thought of an epic based upon either British history or biblical theme. When the time came, he chose the biblical theme and developed it into the grandness scale uh, or uh, grand, a grandest st uh, scale possible. So Paradise Lost, from a Christian perspective, he set out to narrate all important events in the temporal and spiritual history of humankind to answer all important questions to tell what one poet called the history or sorry the story of all things now we are moving to the uh, last or the last important significance or famous as well as the uh, pioneer of the 17th century he is John Dryden John Dryden's poetry flourished during the period from 1600 to 17 which is the period of the restoration Dryden of all the great English writers and more sp especially of all the great English poets was the least original the least capable of inspiring his generation with new ideas of discovering for its new sources of emotion even of producing new artistic forms the poetry of John Dryden possesses a grandeur force and fullness of tone that were eagerly received by readers still having something in common with the 
Elizabethan poetry. His poetry set the tone of the new age in achieving a new clarity and in establishing a self-limiting, somewhat impersonal canon of moderation and good Dryden was famous for writing or using the heroic couplet style of writing poetry. So, Dryden's Polish heroic couplet, which he inherited from less accomplished brasidors and then developed it or developed, became the dominant form in the composition of long, longer poems. The chief poetical works and the most outstanding, the memorable poems written by John Dryden, Absalom and Actoville in 1681 to 1682, Mackie which is rather a long uh, poem written in form of or an heroic couplet. It is a satirical or a great satire written. Uh, in the poetry in jo uh, of John Dryden, Mackie Flacknell written in 1682, and uh, not the last one, Alexander's Feast in 1697. Uh, if we are going to talk about the poetry of the 17th century, the um, the discussion will be a great and tasty and so long unended. In this respect, I would like to sum up all of the characteristics of the poetry of the 17th century in England or the English poetry as a whole to be or to be a feature that shared by all of the poets, all of the groups all together. The first of this feature, the poets should sharpen awareness of the complexity and variety of experience. The second characteristic of the 17th century English poetry, the poets tried their hands at a variety of poetic forms. Third, the Elizabethan conventional forms gave way to the highly personalized forms of, a me of the metaphysical and Johnsonian poets. The fourth point Another feature is the imagery, which is rich, fresh, and striking, continually focuses attention on the perplexing nature of reality. The significance feature is, or another uniting feature of the different poets of the period, I mean the 17th century, is wit, is the use of wits that is the show of learning faculty of each poet in the age. By this page we came to the end of this presentation and thank you for everybody who is listening, who is reading, who is interested in, to, oh, in these a few pages.